and birthday cards. I felt close to you at this time, even though we're physically apart. Your love and support is so appreciated. Your sister in Christ, Jane. So thank you for those of you that remembered her at Christmas and birthday, because I know that cheered her up being stuck inside so much. Well, why don't we go around as we always do and introduce ourselves. We'll start over here. Sherry Heaton, Dottie Heaston, Anna Phillippe, Anna Dishwander, Lori Keeswin, Ginny Graybill, Barbara Anne Bang, Nancy Gall. Nancy Gall. Nancy Gall. Well, again, it's good to be together, and I'll quickly tell you the reason we've rearranged the seating is we're to be having a bathroom put in over there behind the curtain, and we don't need to explain why we don't want to be standing there with the bathroom behind it, but <laughs> so it is. Well, why don't we go ahead and get started since we're live streaming this. We'll open in prayer. Ginny, would you open our time? Father God, thank you that you are our dwelling place and that we can come and abide in your presence and that you are sheltering us under your wings. Thank you for that wonderful, powerful protection that we have by abiding in you. Guide us today in our study. Be with Nancy as she leads us. Thank you for each one who is here, Lord, that we would receive a blessing from you. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jenny. Well, we're kind of continuing what we started last month, and that was being a woman of peace, practical ways to promote peace in our relationships and circumstances. And um, I thought the material I had was just enough for one study, but <laughs> when we got to uh, about 11 o'clock, I realized, no, this is two studies worth. So whatever we finish today, this will complete um, just ways to promote peace in our relationships with people and in our circumstances because I'll go over with you at the end, but we've got March, April, and May different um, aspects of Abigail's study that we want to look at and focus on. When we finished up last um, month, we were looking at the point how to practice and promote peace with people. And we had actually gotten into a few of those points. I want to review them, but I also added some other thoughts to that. So we've got quite a bit on promoting peace with people and practical ways on how to do that. And we had mentioned last month, first, the first important aspect of that, I believe, is to see yourself as God sees you. You might be thinking, well, how's that have to do with promoting peace with people? See yourself as God sees you. Well. Look at Isaiah 49, 16. Isaiah 49, 16. This is a precious, just a precious verse of the Lord's thoughts to us. And uh, in the ESV, well, I'll read it in New King James, and then I'll mention a particular word in the ESV. But it says, See, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. This is God speaking. Your walls are continually before me. And ESV says, see, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Isn't that a beautiful passage? Just to realize that God writes us on the palm of his hand. In other words, God's very, very aware of you, aware of me. He loves us. We're precious to him. He's conscious of everything going on in our lives. And you know, that really helps. When you're dealing with a conflict with somebody, Think about what God says about you. I've inscribed you. He's aware of you. You're precious to him. That gives us confidence, doesn't it? Because Ephesians 6.10 says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So we want to see ourselves as agents of peace and to be his instrument. See yourself as God's instrument, as God's agent of peace. And you want to take your orders from him and his Holy Spirit. If you're dealing with, we all deal with conflicts with people. There isn't anybody <laughs> that doesn't deal with a conflict with people that is either maybe our doings or maybe the other person's doings or maybe some of both of our doings. Um, we're continually dealing with that while we're here on this earth. And we need to really recognize when we're dealing with a conflict where we feel maybe rejected or hurt deeply by another person, 
Look at how God sees you, and that will give you the confidence to step into the situation and deal with it in a biblical way. So first, see yourself as God sees you. And then secondly, in promoting peace with people, pursue peace by making it your ambition. Pursue peace by making it your ambition. And there's verses in God's Word where God really wants us to see that this is a command to Him. This is important to God. Um, it's not something that we can be lackadaisical about. Um, Psalm 34, 14b says, Seek peace and pursue it. Seek peace. Now, to seek something out, you're not just, you know, nonchalant about it. You're being intentional about peace and pursuing. That word pursue is to go after. So God wants us to go after peace. And then there's several other verses I'd like us to look up. Um, would somebody read Hebrews 12, 14? Hebrews 12, 14. Um, Chris, would you read that verse? And then would somebody else read Romans 14, 19? Romans, dot, would you do Romans 14, 19? And then following that, would somebody read Colossians 3, 14 and 15? Who would do Colossians 3? 12, 14 with Hebrews, yes. Um, any takers for Colossians 3, 14 and 15? Ginny? And then, Joy, would you read 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 through 11? 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 through 11. And after you read your passage, just pause for a moment. Um, might have a little thought there, but go ahead um, with Psalm 30, I mean, Hebrews 12, 14, please. Persecuted for God's people, holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Thank you, Chris. And then how about Romans 14, 19? Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things which thou one may edify others. Thank you, Dot. Notice that, therefore let us pursue, or I think Dot's version says follow after, things which make for peace. And as I thought about that, it's like, well, we have to understand the dynamics of peace. You know, it, it's, it's not, okay, we want peace, but... How does this thing work when we're dealing with people? It, it says, let us pursue the things which make for peace. There's almost a science to it, a psychology to it, um, a biblical psychology to understanding the dynamics of peace. And then how about Colossians 3, 14 and 15? But above all these things put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you are called in one body, and be thankful. Thank you, Ginny. So God's peace should be the authority in our lives. It should be the authority on over the fears in our hearts. You know, because sometimes when we're in an issue of conflict with other people, they might see it one way, we might see it another way, but if we're wanting to have peace with that person and it's not working out, what do we need to do? We need to give those fears or those anxieties, those concerns over to God and place it under His authority so that we're not dwelling on that fear and that conflict, but we're dwelling on God. It's His peace that we need to have rule in our hearts. Sorry about that, ladies. <laughs> I forgot that my phone was here. Um, and then the last passage, please. Who would read 1 Thessalonians? I think it was Joy. Thank you. But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And indeed, ye do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. But we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more, and that ye study to be quiet, and to do your own business, and to work with your own hands, as we commanded you. Thank you, Joy. I thought that was interesting, that those two phrases there toward the end, aspire to lead a quiet life, and then to mind your own business. I think these are two ingredients for a peaceful life. Minding our own business, in other words, things that we really don't need to be getting ourselves involved in, and aspiring to lead a quiet life. Um, in other words, 
I think God's saying here, don't meddle, don't gossip, don't be a busybody. Um, he wants us to, to kind of focus in on the life he's given us and how he wants us to do it, but not to be over here and over here and over here if he hasn't called us to do that. So those are just some thoughts under the, the idea of pursuing peace by making it our ambition or our goal, um, because it's important to God. It's a command of God. And then we had talked about this one also. This point was to use good communication skills. And some of you shared some good thoughts about that. And one that stands out to me um, just in my life recently is the importance of being willing to sit down and talk through a situation. You know, if there is a conflict, it does no good to just sweep it under the carpet, so to speak. Because sitting down and talking through a situation brings restoration, it brings clarification, it brings understanding to the whole dynamics of the conflict, what is really going on. Um, sometimes we can just say, okay, we, we, we forgive and move on, but the other times, I think it's really important to be willing and to be courageous enough to sit down and, hey, what happened here and why did it happen? And understand it and clarify it with one another because the avoidance of communication, I think, paves the way for future conflict. Um, and why is that? You don't get it settled, so it's going to creep up again. Right, right. It's, it's really, it's not resolved, is it? If, if it's unresolved and it's swept under the carpet, you're not understanding one another, you're not understanding the dynamics of what happened, you're not talking it out, well, it's still just kind of be under the carpet and it might just crawl back out again. So we need to, to be willing to sit down and talk. Um, the importance of listening, taking our turn, not interrupting. Um, you know, we are sinners and we all are given when we get charged up about something to elaborate, to exaggerate, to say you always, you never. I think it was Barbara Ann that shared that last month and uh, some good things that were shared, you know, but these are huge because all we need to say to somebody is you never, and all of a sudden, what's that do? It puts up a wall, right? Um, but we need to use controlled speech, not critical speech or speech that tears into other people. And I think um, I picked this up on, I think it was something you had said before, Sharon, but I'm not sure. But the importance, or maybe I just picked it up on watching your communication, but the importance if you're going to confront something or talk about something, you always want to buffer it with a kind comment if you can or with a, a compliment, not something that's fluffy or flowery that you don't mean, but something positive to give that person an ear to hear what you might want to say. Um, and I think it's important that we respect one another. You know, just as we looked at that verse where God says, I've inscribed you on the palms of my hand or engraved you, we need to realize that the person we're in a conflict with, God's also inscribed them on his hand. Um, they're made in God's image as well. Um, another aspect of good communication skills is using grace when we speak, using grace. And we looked at this at Life Group this past Sunday night. Um, Andy was looking at it a little bit different angle um, than what I am here. But it says, Colossians 4, 6 says, regarding how we relate to the lost, let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. And he was focusing more on that seasoned with salt, you know, when we're talking to unbelievers. But I thought to myself, wow, if we're to let our speech be seasoned with grace, with unbelievers, shouldn't that be our objective when we're speaking one to another as believers, as as brothers, sisters in the Lord. Any, any thoughts you have? Any things like last month some of you added to communication skills? Barbara Ann. Um, we would um, teach our, like, a lot of times, um, especially teens would have conflict with parents um, in psychiatry. And um, so we had, like, kind of a, um, a way of teaching them. And one of the key things was, just as you had said about um, st 
starting with something that's non-threatening. So if, if you were my mother and I wanted to talk to you about an issue that I was having that I felt wasn't fair, um, I, I would say, with, say to you something to the effect of, um, Mom, I couldn't ask for a better mom. Like, you're always there for me. But often people will then say the but, mm -hmm. which again wipes yes. it out. And because of that, I'm hoping you understand what I need to say to you right now. Mm. Yes, yes, that's good. Good thoughts there. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that's excellent because I think we live in a day and an age where just listening on different Christian radio programming, I just see the emphasis so much on parents. You need to understand your kids. Parents, you need to... Parents, you need to, you need to, you know, but that's a good point. Teaching the teenager to show some respect, to show, to start out, instead of with the guns loaded, start out appreciating. That's that's a really good point. I, like I think that. it's with anyone, though. Yes. You know, like even to be able to say, we've been friends for so long and yes. I value our friendship. And because of that, um, could we talk about something that happened last week? Um, just so we could sort it out, you know, like... Yes. That butt is right out of there. <laughs> yes, yes. Very good point. Um, thank you very much for sharing that. Yeah, there yes, you go, good, Chris. Good. <laughs> because, because. Instead of Anybody butt. else? Anybody else? I think, I think that makes sense. I mean, if, if I did something wrong or something out of the way, I would appreciate if somebody approached me in a kind way rather than putting me down right away because I'm already down to begin with. Right, right. <clears throat> well, good. Some good thoughts there. Um, so these are ways to good communication when we're dealing with a conflict. Uh, fourthly, set healthy boundaries. Set healthy boundaries. Oh, some of these I know. When they first come out, it's like, what's this mean? Um, <laughs> But we look at the life of Abigail, and she really laid down her life. She really um, died to self, so to speak. Um, but she was doing it in such a way that it was for the better good. It was for a higher good. And it was for a temporary, you know, she was putting herself in this position temporarily to achieve a higher aim. Um, and I think it's important that we don't see ourselves that we're just called to lay down, let people walk all over us. But we need to see Christ is our pattern, Christ is our example. But at the same time, there's times where, no, you're not asked by God to just be the doormat and to be walked all over. And it's interesting because Andy's been speaking on this the last couple weeks about Paul on Wednesday nights in the Acts study. And I had... Um, had that passage down in another passage. If you look at the life of Paul, it's very interesting to me. Paul went through all kinds of persecution, all kinds of pain and suffering for the cause of Christ. He took abuse from a lot of people, but there came times where Paul would uh, speak about his God-given rights as a Roman citizen. And last night we looked at Acts 22, 22 through 29, where, you know, Paul didn't allow himself to be beaten when he could avoid it. He said, I am a Roman citizen. So we do have, there's a point to where, yes, there's times where we need to claim our God-given rights like Paul did, um, utilize our God-given rights is maybe a better way to say it. Let's look at one of these passages, and that would be Acts 16 and verses 35 to 40. And uh, Acts 16, 35 to 40, if somebody would read that for us. And when it was day, the magistrate sent the officers saying, let those men go. So the keeper of the prison reported these words to Paul saying, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Now therefore depart and go in peace. But Paul said to them, they have beaten us openly on condemned Romans and have thrown us into prison. And now do they put us out secretly? No indeed, let them come themselves and get us out. And the officers told these words to the magistrates and they were afraid when they heard that they were Romans. 
Then they came and pleaded with them and brought them out and asked them to depart from the city. So they went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. Thank you, Jenny. I mean, that's a really interesting passage, isn't it? Because I think there are times where we think that we are called to just, you know, whatever abuse somebody wants to hurl at us, just take it, you know, and just, you know, this is keeping peace. But we see here that there's times as, as people made in God's image um, that we need to utilize our God-given rights in a situation like Paul did. You know, they beat him, they put him in prison, but Paul was saying, I'm a Roman citizen. They had no right to do this. And they, they wanted Paul to come out, just get Paul and Silas on their way, you know, just quit, quietly get out of here, please. And Paul was saying, no. He said, you publicly disgraced us and beat us as Roman citizens. You come out and ask us, you know, to leave. And they did that. They actually came and, as Ginny's version said, they pleaded with them. They had to beg Paul, you know, and, and what, what it was, was they were having to show him respect after disrespecting him and disgracing him before many people. And I think that there is a time that we have to, oh, we just need God's wisdom and discernment because we are called to take up our cross. We are told to follow. Jesus Christ was a lamb before his shears, you know, he, he, he was condemned to the cross and he did it in humility and disgrace for us. But there's also a time where you're really not promoting peace by just absorbing abuse and letting somebody vent on you. There's times where we need to say, wait a minute here, wait a minute. As Paul said, I'm a Roman citizen. You know, you're a daughter of the Lord. You're a daughter of the heavenly king. And so we, we do need to be careful. We need God's wisdom. Um, we need his discernment in, in setting healthy boundaries. Um, there are times where, yes, God takes, wants us to be like Abigail did initially. She fell on her face before David, and she's like, you know, the blame's on me. Um, but what was she trying to do? She was trying to keep a whole bunch of people from being slaughtered. So there is a time for that. But there's also a time to say, uh-uh, this isn't the way God has called you to treat me, and I'm, I'm not going to absorb your abuse I made in God's image, you're made in God's image. And just kind of try to temper, temper the situation. So pray and ask God to, by his Holy Spirit, to give you wisdom to set healthy boundaries. You're not called to be um, a vent absorber for every human being. Um, you are made in God's image. Can I give you an example of that? Because sure. it just happened. Okay. Um, there's a, a, a really peaceful, sweet guy that goes to our church, and we're in a group together with a bunch of other people. And he said when he was going on through school, he would use the Bible in a lot of his um, assignments, like use the Word of God. And um, his teacher um, had, like, mocked him at mm. times. And um, so he really felt that he needed to... to to speak to that and he was saying you know basically the equality that he um, should have as one of his students and um, that his beliefs were a major part of his life and um, and then lastly and because I'm here I'm helping pay your salary <laughs> <laughs> Wow <laughs> it, no it was so awesome yes and I'm, I'm gonna have to share with him you know that I just thought of him because wow. I was just so impressed because I would he's such a peacemaker <laughs> and, wow. and yet when he needed to right. he spoke right. up and, and there's some real wisdom there in yes. the way he handled it and mm -hmm. very very good I like that illustration thank you so set healthy boundaries when you're dealing with trying to promote peace in, in relationships. And fifthly, don't exhaust yourself on situations that God has not called you to. You are not called to be the agent of peace in every conflict. And we need to realize that Some, sometimes God does want us to, but other times God doesn't want us to step into a situation. We need to have God's wisdom and discernment because if you use up all your resources, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically on others, you're not going to be able to be a filled channel to maybe somebody God has prepared and ready for you. And sometimes we have to 
discern? Is this somebody who has an ear for peace? Is this somebody who wants peace? And if not, maybe God doesn't want us to, to try to make peace out of something that can't be resolved. But maybe God has another situation. So we need to pray for discernment so much when we're trying to follow peace and pursue peace in relationships. Ask God, are you calling me to involve myself as an agent of peace in this conflict? Or do you want me to step back and you will resolve it another way? Or maybe they don't have a heart to resolve it. So use wisdom in that. Um, number six, promote peace by helping others take responsibility. And like I said, some of these we talked about last month. I added some to it. So I'm, I'm not quite sure which ones we had touched on. Um, but help others take responsibility. And if you look at Abigail, that's exactly what she did. She wasn't enabling David at all or Nabal to continue a destructive lifestyle. Abigail intervened very briefly in David's life, didn't she? But it was so that he would wake up, he would see things, and he would take responsibility. And that's, that's what she was helping him to do. She was helping him to respond in a responsible manner in order to pave the way to peace because he was going to take out all of Nabal's household. He was ready. He had told his men, strap on your swords. So she intervened just briefly to help him get back on the way to peace. And promoting peace is not covering up for someone. David realized that, you know, wow, he, he even told her, I would have done this harm if God had not sent you to me. So she helped him to see, this is your responsibility, David. Before God, you're not to be acting this way. And he had a heart to, to receive. He had an ear to hear. Not everybody does have a heart to receive words like that. Um, but we need to be careful that we're not avoiding keeping another accountable or, or trying to maintain a pseudo peace. In other words, you know, maybe if I don't confront this family member about this issue in their lives, I'll, you know, we'll have peace. But is it really peace? No, it can just be a, a false peace. There might be a surface quietness, but underneath there isn't. Um, it's only an appearance because you want to never mistake in peace for enabling a person in a sinful lifestyle. Um, what are what are some addictive lifestyles in which often family or friends will enable the individual to continue that way because they want peace in the family? That's a good friend and I want peace. What are some addictive behaviors or destructive lifestyles? Right. Okay. <clears throat> Gambling. Gambling, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, pornography, alcoholism, gambling, um, infidelity, physical sexual abuse, drugs, eating disorders. I mean, the list goes on and on. And uh, that can be really tough to say, we need to talk, you know, if it's something that you can talk about or needing to use outside people and get them involved in a situation to put an end to something that is an addictive lifestyle where people are being drawn into this abuse or where it's just allowing that person to go on in a lifestyle that's destroying them. There's no peace in their life. There's no peace in family members' lives. Um, yes, we need to really use wisdom because I think even like alcohol, I mean, how many women you know, have subjected themselves to the abuse of an alcoholic husband and they cover up for him why he's late to work or why he's, you know. Um, but now we see there's many more addictions. I mean, drugs with young people is just going over the top. Um, and yes, it, it's, it's not ours to cover up for somebody that is maybe in a sexual addiction, you know, and just, well, that's their life and everybody else needs to just accept it. No, no, I, I don't think that that is really making for dynamics of peace. So we, we need to be wise in how we help people take responsibility for themselves, how we're not enabling them and just thinking we've got peace when really that person's life 
is the farthest thing from peaceful, and the relationship is not peaceful. Any thoughts about that? The habit of lying, lying to others and lying to yourself. Yes, yes, yes. That's, that's a real important one. Any others? Negative. Go ahead. Conflict's going to be resolved if the person continues to stay in the state that they are. Negative thinking about yourself yes. takes you into depression. Yes. Yes. And, and a true friend will step in there and say, you know, your thinking is destroying you. And it's destroying your relationship with others as well. Sometimes it's hard to say those things, but you know, if we really care about people, we'll do that. Um, when I was living off campus, and I think I was working on my master's, which I only went to one semester on, um, down at Liberty, I was living with some roommates, and we could tell that, that this um, one roommate had an eating disorder, and we all just kinda, you know, we just went through it, and it finally got to a point where I'm like, I can't do this anymore, I can't ignore it, we have to sit down and talk about this white elephant in the apartment. And we did, you know, we did, but it was hard. It was very difficult to do. But in doing that, I was hoping to maybe open up the situation like we can't let you keep ruining your body like this. You can't destroy yourself with laxatives. And, you know, we, we've got to work on this situation here. It's hard to do that kind of thing. But if we really care about others, we'll be willing to step in and say the hard things and not just, you know, let it go and ignore it um, if we want true peace in their lives. Number seven, promote peace by forgiving and asking forgiveness. And um, somebody mentioned this one last month. And uh, I think that's when you, Barbara Ann, had made mention that if we're apologizing, don't use the words but or if, <laughs> you know. I know I was wrong, but you, <laughs> you know, we, we, we just don't want to go there. Um, and it, it requires humility to ask for forgiveness. Cray set that example for us of humility. And, and we need to have humility to ask forgiveness, but also I think when we're forgiving, somebody if we're really not sure what we're forgiving them for is that really promoting peace if we just say i forgive you no or if we say will you forgive me but we don't say what we are asking to be forgiven for i think it's so important that we use specifics when we're asking for forgiveness you know would you forgive me for saying and then say what we said to them if it's all right to say it or, you know, will you forgive me for saying what I said, but in a wrong way? My tone of voice was not the right tone of voice. There might not have been anything wrong with my words, but my tone of voice was sarcastic toward you. Would you forgive me? Or would you forgive me for assassinating your character? Um, would you forgive me for being harsh with you, for being critical with you? Um, those kind of things are, are important that we make specifics, what we're really asking for forgiveness, because there's not going to be that reconciliation of peace if we just say, will you forgive me? I was just feeling a little bit upset because I'm having a hard time with whatever in life. Is that really a good apology? No. It, 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 it's really, a, in my opinion, a pseudo or a fake, a false apology. If we're really sorry, then we need to take responsibility and not excuse it off when I was having a bad day or this is happening in my life. That might be true. That's happening in our lives, but it doesn't excuse us, does it? Um, so when we're, we're trying to promote peace with people, we need to be willing to ask for forgiveness um, but we also need to be willing to forgive. And it might be, you know, saying to that person, you know, you're asking me to forgive you, but I feel like you're kind of excusing what you did or what specifically are you wanting me to, excuse, you know, forgive you for? That's kind of difficult. But if it's going to really resolve it and there's really going to be peace and the relationship's going to be restored, we kind of have to dig deeper sometimes 
and, and get to the ouchy parts of it. And uh, because in the long run, if you dig down, get the infection out, then it can heal. But if you're not gonna dig down a little bit and you're just going, mm, let's just move on, well, yeah, it's gonna come back up. Um, any thoughts? Yes. I was yeah. just curious, how would you handle that if the other party doesn't want to go there? <laughs> been there. <laughs> yes, well, you know, there's been a situation in my life where I wanted to resolve a conflict, and can we sit down and talk? And the other person will not sit down and talk, and yet they have something in their minds that I did that I don't really think I did, and I can't really figure out how this was wrong. And that's difficult because I like to have peace with people. Um, and we, I've approached it two or three times. Can we please sit down and talk? No, we don't need to talk. No, we don't need to talk. At that point, we just need to give it over to God. We've done what we can. And we'll actually get to, um, to that point. I'm actually going to jump forward here. And that is remember that you're not responsible for the other person's words and their treatment of you and the way they handle the situation. Um, Romans 12, 18 says, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. And, and I love that God gave us that verse because I'm not the kind of person that wants to know somebody's got a, an issue with me and they won't let me try to resolve it with them. Um, it doesn't it doesn't sit good. I'm the kind of person that will carry around guilt, you know, even if it's false guilt. But the Lord says, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you. Why would he say that? Because he knows it's not always possible. And, and just do what you can do, he says. Um, if peace has not been achieved in a conflict, this does not mean that you have failed. Um, even if you feel that way, it, it doesn't mean that because God's saying, if it's possible, as much as you can, but I realize God's saying that maybe you can't. Um, I found this really interesting. I had been reading through the Psalms, and I don't even remember coming across this before. Psalm 125 through 7. Um, Psalm 125 through 7. I'm going to read it to you. It says, Woe is me that I dwell in Meshek that I dwell among the tents of Kedar, with an exclamation point. Woe is me, because this is where I live. My soul has dwelt too long with one who hates peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. Have you ever been in that situation where you long to have peace, but you felt that you couldn't achieve it because the other person didn't want it? I mean, here the psalmist is saying, my soul has dwelt too long with those who hate hate peace. You know, so sometimes no matter how, how hard you try, um, how much you desire peace with another, it's, it's not in your power. It's in your power to manage your own attitude. And sometimes you might have to pray continually, God, you know, give me the right thoughts. Give me the right attitude in my heart. Um, but you're not responsible for the other person. So remember that because, yes, we, we are to do all we can do, but sometimes, as God knows, there isn't any more you can do to resolve peace. You can't make a person um, sit down and talk to you. You cannot make a person forgive you. You cannot make a person ask to be forgiven. Um, you just do what, what God has asked you to do, but don't take responsibility for the other person. Um, does that answer your question, Joy? Okay, Jenny. See, that first verse in that Psalm 120 yes. says, In my distress I cried to the Lord, and he heard me. And that is mm -hmm. so comforting. You know, even though this other person did not want to make peace with David, right. and yet God was there for him. God yes. heard him. God knew yes. the struggle that he was facing. Thank you, Jenny. Mm -hmm. Good point, because one of my points I jumped over is just the importance of prayer and praying to God when you're in a conflict with other people. You just, you just, yeah, need God's wisdom. Thank you, Jenny. So these are just some thoughts about how to promote peace in our relationships. But let's move on to our circumstances, um, circumstances in our lives that we're not 
happy with. Um, maybe it's the diagnosis of cancer. Maybe it's a job loss. Maybe it's an unfulfilled um, dream that you had that you haven't reached. Maybe it's um, the death of a loved one. Um, there's a book that I just came upon last evening, Light for My Path for Grandparents, and it states, Peace is God's gift to us. It's a gift we can possess in the midst of sorrow and sickness, just as much as in joy and health. For in human terms, it is a peace that passes understanding. So the peace that God gives us in our circumstances, we can have peace even though we've gone through maybe a job loss or a disappointment, um, you know, in a relationship or bad news with our health. Um, God can give us that peace that passes all understanding. But I think when we're dealing with peace in our circumstances, the first thing we need to do is step back and like Abigail, identify, is there anything within my power that I can change in this circumstance? You know, because that's what Abigail did. I mean, she, the servants came to her and said, this is a situation. She stepped back. She saw the situation. Okay, the household, all males are going to be slaughtered. Is there anything I can do to step in and help bring peace? And sure enough, you know, she loaded those animals with food. The way to a man's heart is his belly, right? She, she was like, what can I do? And God gave her wisdom because God gave her those words. I mean, those words she said were so wisely stated. She showed respect to David first, and then she had David's ear. You know, so man, God was all over this thing. So like Abigail, step back and say it to yourself, is there anything I can do to change the circumstances that I'm in? Um, what is in my power to change? Um, Psalm 119, 165 says, Great peace have those who love your law. So if we're looking, how would God have me to handle this situation I'm in, in in life right now? God can give us the wisdom to do it his way and to bring some peaceful changes. But what's interesting to me, as I've seen with some people that are in a terribly dysfunctional situation, a non-peaceful circumstance in their lives, they won't change it. They don't want change because they find security in dysfunction. And that's really sad, but somehow we become people of security so strongly that we can find security in a dysfunctional, damaging circumstance that we have power to change, but we don't want to change it because well, at least I feel secure knowing what's going to happen. I'm going to be mistreated. But, you know, and it's just so sad when you see people that are in a situation where they can change the circumstances. And God doesn't want you in this, you know, dysfunctional, lacking of peace circumstance. You can do something about it, but they won't. They won't take the courage and the step trusting God for change. Um, so, yes, first, change what is in your power to change. Um, if you want peace in your circumstances. Secondly, recognize the sovereignty of God. Um, appeal to him. You know, recognize God's sovereignty. Because if you can't change anything, you look at the situation and it's like, really, I can't change the fact that I just got a diagnosis of cancer or my loved one just got a diagnosis of cancer. I can't change the fact that this person that I love so dearly has just passed away. I can't change the fact that I just lost my job. You know, so sometimes we, we see a situation, but if we lost our job, maybe we can get another job. See, you can change something. If I got, a, you know, um, the word that one of my loved ones passed away, I can't change that. So what do I do? I realize that God is working all things together for a pattern of good. Romans eight twenty eight promises us that to those who love him to those that are living in accordance with God's will in their lives. He says, I, I've got it under control. This is not something that is easy for you, but you can have my peace in it. Um, so we want to see God's sovereignty in it. And then thirdly, how do we have peace in our circumstances? And I'm sorry, we're, we're going so fast, but I wanted to finish this um, peace study. <laughs> Accept what God has allotted to you. Accept what God has allotted to you. Because if we can't change our undesirable circumstances 
And if God isn't stepping in to change our circumstances, then we need to accept our circumstances, don't we? And that is something that I, you know, I witnessed in the life of my son and daughter-in-law as I had shared before about their baby having anencephaly. Um, you know, what can I do? Well, there was prayer and there was some prayer and fasting on the part of my son and my husband. You know, just God, you know, can you, would you do a miracle? But then if God doesn't step in and change the circumstances, what do we need to do? We need to accept the circumstances. And in acceptance, as Elizabeth Elliot always said, often said rather, in acceptance lies peace. And isn't that true? You know, we change what we can change. We appeal to God who's sovereign to step in. But if he doesn't, we accept it. Because Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So we need to accept that. Since God is God and I am not, I'm not going to understand his ways, am I? I'm not going to always be able to make sense of a situation. But peace comes when we accept and embrace our circumstances. And uh, we want to accept them, but, and that's something that I learned from Elizabeth Elliot, Nancy Lee DeMoss. I've learned not just accepting, but embracing the circumstances in our lives. And, and seeing what God can do, how he can use them for good. So accept what God has allotted to you. Um, fourthly, how do, we, how do we promote peace in our circumstances? Well, stay your mind on the Lord. Stay your mind on the Lord. Um, I recently saw a quote, um, and it said, Peace is not the absence of trouble. It is the presence of Christ in the midst of that trouble. How true is that? You know, how true is that? And that only happens when we're staying our mind on the Lord. Um, can somebody read Isaiah 26, 3 for us? Isaiah 26, 3. Or if you want to quote it, quote it. Keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Thank you, Jenny. So what kind of peace do we see offered here? Perfect. Perfect. I mean, that's a heavenly peace, isn't it? Perfect peace. But what do we need to do to have it? Right. Stay our minds on the Lord and trust the Lord. Um, we need to anchor our hearts in the Lord. And Nancy um, DeMoss uses that word tether often. She'll say, tether your heart, tether your mind. And tether means to, to tie with a rope or a chain so that something can't move, like tying up, tethering a horse, an animal, so that they're not going to what? Run away. They're going to stay put there. And we need to anchor or stay or tether our mind to God because if we don't, what's going to happen? It's just going to wander off, and we're going to miss that peace, and we're going to wander into the realm of anxiety. So we need to trust in the Lord, and that's easier said than done. Um, but trust is that confident reliance on God during the turbulent times in our lives. Um, when we trust in Him, we have that confident reliance on God during the turbulent times in our lives. And that gives us peace. Um, so stay your mind on the Lord. It's difficult to do, but, but come back continually. Okay, I'm, I'm wandering off here in the realm of anxiety. Lord, help me put my mind back on you. Um, something else that can promote peace in our lives and circumstances, and Ginny mentioned this, and that is prayer produces peace in your circumstances. And, and it was something I had down for in our conflicts with other people, but it's also when we don't have peace in our circumstances. Prayer is such an ingredient that is huge because it's a promise. Um, pray and get others to pray for you. 
um, because this is something that God gives us as a possession that he avails to us. And we have his promise, don't we? Who can think of a verse where God promises his peace when we pray? about Philippians 4, 6, and 7? Does somebody want to read that or quote it? Yes. But by prayer and supplication, let your request be known unto God and the peace of God. Which surpasses all understanding. It'll do what? Garden protection. Right. Isn't this a, just a, oh, this is a power packed passage. Philippians, if you're taking notes, Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Um, there's so much in here. Let's look at it a moment. We see, be anxious for nothing. God doesn't want us to be anxious, does he? He doesn't want anxiety to be filling our hearts and minds. But he says, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. So we got, Three things here we're being told, prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. And that word supplication is found 60 times in the Bible, and it's a Latin verb that means to plead humbly, to plead humbly. In other words, it's the action of asking or begging for something earnestly and humbly. We're not just talking about a casual, vague, nonchalant prayer to God, like, God, you know, I'm just having all these prayers. I don't know why you're not doing something, God. Isn't that how we act in our humanity? But God says, you know, stop here a moment. He says, prayer with supplication, you know, humble yourself before me. Get earnest about this. How about some blood, sweat, and tear prayers? And then God says, mix it with what? Thanksgiving, right, Irma? Thanksgiving. So, you know, we're in the midst of this terrible turmoil in our lives. We're praying to God, but he's like, you know, go a little deeper, you know, be earnest about this, really plead and seek my face. And if I hear you being earnest about this, mix it with Thanksgiving because we can get so focused on this circumstance in our life where we don't have any peace that we can become negative, can't we, and depressed. But God says, Mix it with thanksgiving. What good psychology? Because then we're saying, Lord, I thank you that I've seen you step in my life and work in my life in this way in the past. God, thank you that I got up this morning and I saw the beauty of your creation. And God, thank you. So we're, we're praying and we're begging God, but we're mixing it with thanksgiving, realizing that while I'm in this circumstance, I have this blessing and this blessing and this blessing and this situation to thank God for. And then he says it's going to guard our hearts and minds. You know, if we do this prayer, supplication, thanksgiving, God's going to give us that peace. And when that peace comes, it's going to protect our hearts. It's going to protect our minds. So we won't be filled with anxiety. Um, great verse there to practice in our lives. So we do get that peace. And if we don't have the peace, let's not be so quick to blame God. Let's say to ourselves, okay, am I praying? Am I taking it to a deeper level? Am I putting supplication into this? And am I mixing it with thanksgiving? Um, so we want to make prayer a part of promoting peace in our circumstances. And lastly, um, there's other points, but I, I said we're going to finish by 12, and we got three more minutes. I think we can get this in. <laughs> Know that in the end, God will accomplish peace in our circumstances. Um, Isaiah 26, 12 in the ESV says, O oh Lord, you will ordain peace for us, for you have indeed done for us all our works. A beautiful passage. You know, God will. He, he ordains peace for us. And if we think, we won't read the verses um, in our story of Abigail, but the end of 1 Samuel 25 has quite an incredible ending, doesn't it? I mean, it's almost like a fairy tale ending. We see peace being promoted in all areas of these circumstances. God chooses. Nabal is not a man of peace. God takes Nabal out of the picture, but he restores peace in David's life. He restores peace in Abigail's life because what happens there? Right, she marries David. Um, Nabal is no longer in her life. 
but she gives David to her as a husband. But think of all those people that worked under Nabal, that were under his authority. What happened when God said, enough's enough? They had peace in their lives. Can you imagine having to work for just Abigail and, and David? I mean, being delegated, okay, these are your responsibilities. So there was so much peace abounding in the end of this chapter. But in John 16, Jesus says, these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So we need to accept hardship. We need to accept difficulty in our life. We're in a sin-cursed world. We are going to have circumstances that are not what we would choose if we could choose our own circumstances for ourselves. But our end of the story ultimately is going to be just like Abigail's. Because what does Jesus Christ call the church? His bride. He's going to come on the white horse and he's going to take us home for all eternity. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, comfort our hearts with the fact that in the end, there is peace for eternity. Wow. You know, we're living in perilous times. Um, nobody denies that. I mean, you have things happening all the time. In last year's year of COVID and things have gone from bad to worse. Uh, so we are living in times that we can be filled with anxiety and much concern. But again, I want to echo Jesus' beautiful words in John 14, 27. Jesus says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So Jesus is promising he will give us that peace to endure any kind of situation in our lives, any kind of conflict, whether it's a conflict with people or it's a conflict in our circumstances. He will be with us. He will give us peace. So may God give you peace in your life. May God help you with things we shared. I'm sorry it was so power packed, but the clock is saying 12, and so we did this thing. <laughs> yes, Dot. I ask it his will, not mine. Okay. Because mm -hmm. so many times, years past, I'd ask for things and they mm -hmm. didn't happen. But for a reason. They don't, well, he doesn't always ask, answer. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, it's good to ask for his will. Right. Sometimes we really don't know his no. will. And that is patterning your prayer after the Lord's Prayer, right? Yep. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Yep. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. So it's a biblical way of praying. That's so good. sometimes we don't need what we ask for. <laughs> right. And we can get and frustrated. It's not good for us. <laughs> right. Right. Really? You're right. So. And we can get frustrated with that. Yeah. But you're right. We need to always pray within the will of the Lord. And uh, I would like to open it up for more comments. But right now I'm going to thank those that joined by live stream. And we're going to cut it off. Anybody else?